Hello, everyone. Welcome to, to the webinar today on diabetes. Every number counts. Your health is your wealth. We have some great panelists who will highlight the new technologies used in diabetes testing and their use in helping us manage our diabetes. Before we start, we would like to thank all the volunteers who have worked tirelessly to, in developing this webinar. I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement where we acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the diverse Indigenous peoples all across Canada, and honor the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chipewa, the whole Dinosaunis, the Wendat, Musqueam, Squamish, and Silvertooth First Nation communities where we live and work. My name is Alnur Suleiman, and I'm a pharmacist and a certified diabetes educator. I am so excited to be moderating today's session and look forward to learning about hypoglycemia and the new technologies that are revolutionizing diabetes care. I'm excited to have two experts, Dr. Ali Prabtani and Mona Kavani, join us today. As well, we have Zahur Mouani, who will share his experience with one of the new testing devices. The objectives of today's session are to understand hypoglycemia symptoms, signs, and treatment, to to review new monitoring technologies in diabetes, to introduce the five to thrive meaningful movement pillar, to share the lived experience of a Jamaati member using Dexcom G6 continuous uh, glucose monitoring device, and to explain how to interpret and understand your glucose profile report. Before we start also, we'd like everyone to know that any information that is provided in this webinar should not be considered specific medical advice and is not intended as a substitute for medical professional help, guidance, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare providers with any questions you may have regarding your medical care. care. The healthcare panelists in this webinar are not affiliated with any specific products related to this presentation, nor do they endorse them. So we will start off with a quick talk on hypoglycemia. The learning objectives of this part of the session are to become with, uh, familiar with the symptoms of hyperglycemia and how you treat hyperglycemia, um, what, is hyper, uh, what is hyperglycemia and awareness, and what to consider when you're driving with diabetes. So how do we define hyperglycemia? The first part would be the development of symptoms. Symptoms could be mild, such as trembling, palpitations, sweating, anxiety, hunger, or nausea or they could be more severe where uh, the brain is involved because not enough blood sugar is getting to the brain. Things like difficulty concentrating, confusion, dizziness, weakness, drowsiness, vision changes, or difficulty speaking. The second part of the definition would be having a low blood glucose level when it's measured less than four millimoles per liter. As well, um, the third part would be the symptoms resolve after taking a carbohydrate um, or simple sugar. So what are some of the risk factors for hypoglycemia? It could be using medications that lower your blood glucose levels, things like insulin or glyburite, chronic kidney disease, recurrent low blood sugar levels, being unaware of and getting blood sugar levels, not recognizing the symptoms that, um, um, can, that tell you about blood sugar levels, being elderly that prone to more hypoglycemia events, erratic meal times or skipping meals, alcohol intake, unplanned exercise or being more active than you'd expect to be, losing weight, because with losing weight, your blood sugar levels improve. And if you don't adjust your diabetes medications, you could go uh, into hypoglycemia. So if you have any of these risk factors, check your blood sugar levels regularly to make sure you're fine. Hypoglycemia can be classified into mild, moderate, or severe. In mild hypoglycemia, mild symptoms are present, and the but the person is able to self-treat. In moderate hypoglycemia, you get mild and some of the more severe symptoms that we talked about earlier, but the person is still able to self-treat. In severe hypoglycemia, the person needs help from somebody else. 
they may be unconscious, and blood glucose levels are typically less than 2.8 millimoles per liter. The concern is without treatment, such low blood sugar levels can lead to seizures and can be a life-threatening condition. So how do you treat hypoglycemia? First of all, you have to recognize the symptoms, the ones we talked about, mild or moderate. Um, test blood sugar levels to see if it's less than four millimoles per liter. Treat with a fast acting sugar or carbohydrate. The treatment would be 15 grams if it's mild or moderate, 20 grams if it's severe. Wait 15 minutes and test to see if your blood sugar level is greater than four millimoles per liter. And if not, then you would repeat the process and take 15 more grams of a simple carbohydrate and test in 15 minutes. The easy way to remember this is the 15-15 rule. Um, 15 grams of carbohydrate with and wait 15 minutes. And then um, you would eat your usual snack or meal at the time of day it's due if it's within one hour. And if it's more than one hour away, you would snack with 15 grams of carbohydrate or plus protein just to make sure your sugar levels stay above the, 4.0 millimoles per liter. So what are examples of a 15 gram simple carbohydrate or sugar? Things like 15 grams of glucose in the form of glucose tablets, 15 mils of three teaspoons or three packets of sugar dissolved in water, 150 mils of sugar or of juice or regular soft drink, six lifesavers, because each lifesaver is 2.5 grams of uh, simple sugar, or 15 mils, one tablespoon of honey. So I'm gonna pause here just to um, maybe put one of the panelists on the spot. I'm gonna ask Mona, um, we often get the question, is chocolate a good source to treat hyperglycemia? Thank you, Elmer, for this question. And no, chocolate okay. is not a good source of uh, treating hypoglycemia because it contains protein and fat, which can slow down the process of increasing the blood sugar at a minimum 15 minutes. So you need, the key is 15 grams simple or fast acting sugar in order to increase blood sugar. If your blood sugar is above four, it's not less than four, then you can have a simple carbohydrate or carbohydrate and protein snack so that it doesn't go low again. So the protein and the fat in the, in the snack will help blood sugar from going low again. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I got one more to add to that. Sometimes people ask because they drink diet pop, whether that would be something they could use to treat hypoglycemia? No, so diet pop contains sweetener, which uh, can actually not do anything to your blood sugar. It goes in as it comes out. So you need to have sugar, regular pop or juice, not diet pop. Great, thank you for that information. It's because a lot of people have diet pop, so just to understand that that might not work to treat hypoglycemia. Thank you so much, Mona. Thank you. So how do you treat somebody who has severe hypoglycemia and, and is unconscious? The, um, the treatment for such a case would be using something called glucagon. Glucagon is a hormone that causes a rapid rise in your blood sugar levels. Um, you can, it comes as a one milligram injectable where it has to be mixed and injected or more or, or a three milligram nasal glucagon where you just spray into the person's nostril and then it gets absorbed and raises their blood sugar levels. It's important to call 911, especially if the person is unconscious and, uh, um, and to discuss the incident with the, uh, with your diabetes healthcare team, just to make sure uh, to understand what happened and how to uh, prevent it from happening again. What is hypoglycemia and awareness? So hypoglycemia and awareness occurs when someone doesn't experience or perceive or recognize the early warning signs and symptoms we talked about earlier of hypoglycemia. It's caused by repeated ep episodes of hypoglycemia. The body just stops recognizing a blood sugar level as being abnormal. And so what happens is this person goes straight into severe hypoglycemia and um, and so they could be conscious and then unconscious all of a sudden. And uh, it can be, as we said before, a life-threatening condition. So fortunately, um, what the treatment is um, not too hard. It's um, reversed by preventing hypoglycemia. So if you can keep your blood sugar levels above 
um, your, the four millimoles per liter consistently, then your body will start to recognize the symptoms, the mild symptoms we talked about, and you would be able to recognize it before you go into um, severe hypoglycemia. One of the things that um, happens is it happens overnight because a lot of people, you, you don't eat during the night and your blood sugar levels often drop during the night and you're not aware of it. And if you are not aware of it, you don't know you're getting hypoglycemia and awareness and it can happen one day during the day and you don't realize it. And fortunately, some of the new devices we're gonna talk about today will give you a better idea of what's happening with hypoglycemia, especially we'd say when you're sleeping. <coughs> Another important topic is driving and diabetes. It's very important to make sure that you measure your blood sugar levels before you drive. This is especially important if you're taking things that lower your blood sugar levels like insulin or medications uh, like glyburide. If your blood glucose levels are less than four millimoles per liter, do not drive until you take that 15 grams of carbohydrate. Retest and drive only if your blood sugar levels are at five millimoles per liter. Wait 40 minutes before driving, because this is the time it takes for judgment and reflexes to the brain to fully recover from hypoglycemia. You can retest, make sure you're above the five, and then you can and drive. So just remember five to drive. If you're at five, it's okay to drive. Keep it, uh, some pointers is to keep a fast acting carbohydrate example, some quick dextrose tablets within easy reach in your car in case you need it all of a sudden. If you feel hypoglycemia coming on during driving, stop and then take the, um, take the carbohydrate and see if your blood sugar levels are, are above 4.0 millimoles per liter. Wait the 40 minutes before you start to drive again. And on longer trips, make sure you have regular meals, snacks, and rest. And if it's a really long drive, make sure you test your blood sugar levels every four hours, unless you have one of the new devices which might give you an indication of what's happening with your blood sugar levels. So there are a couple of excellent resources on the Diabetes Canada website. Um, the first resource um, that talks about hypoglycemia has what we talked about today, all the symptoms to watch for, how to treat it, the simple sugars that you can use. Um, the second one is uh, called Drive Safe with Diabetes. It um, gives you all the, the precautions and what you have to do to make sure you're driving safe with diabetes. And one thing to add here, it's only um, when you're operating heavy machinery, or anything like that, the same principles would apply as if you were driving. You wanna make sure you're fit to fit to operate the machinery. machinery. So these resources um, can be printed and kept as a handy reference. So the hypoglycemia take-home points. Um, hypoglycemia can be life-threatening, especially if it's in the severe phase. It is important to recognize and treat hypoglycemia. However, it's safer and more effective to prevent the low blood sugar levels. It's important to talk to your diabetes healthcare team about prevention and emergency treatment of hypoglycemia. And I would add probably that it would be very good for you to make sure your family members and those close to you are also aware of how to treat hypoglycemia and to recognize the symptoms because they may see something before you understand it. Remember the 15-15 rule to treat hypoglycemia, 15 grams of carbohydrate, wait 15 minutes and retest. Um, important to wear diabetes identification, such as a medical alert bracelet, bracelet in case of an emergency, um, then they, they know that you're di you have diabetes. For driving, remember five to drive and print out the hypoglycemia resource guide on symptoms and how to treat it, as well as the drive safe um, diabetes guide and keep it handy. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Mona Kabani. Mona, is a practicing registered nurse and certified diabetes educator at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in Toronto. Mona has been a certified diabetes educator since 2015 and holds a foot care nurse certification as well. She completed her bachelor of science degree in nursing from McMaster University in Hamilton. She's currently serving as a steering committee member for the Smiley Nurses Alliance in Ontario. On to you, Mona. Thank you, Alnur. That was wonderful information about hypoglycemia and how to treat it. I'm just going to share my slides here. Okay, so I've been in this field of diabetes for about seven years, and it's amazing to see how many technologies come out each year. 
Um, and so the objectives today are to review and um, some standard monitoring technologies in diabetes, be it old like glucose monitors or new such as Dexcom or uh, continuous glucose monitoring or flash glucose monitoring. It's also to discuss advantages and limitations of these new devices, um, as well as to provide a resource for costs and coverage of these devices across Canada. So glucose monitoring has three main purposes, and it's to judge how well changes to diet, activity, and medications are working to maintain healthy blood sugar levels, to help people living with diabetes make dosing decisions regarding their medication, especially insulin. It not only helps people living with diabetes, but it also helps the healthcare team to make decisions about your treatment and also to detect and prevent hypoglycemia that Alnur just talked about. So the hypoglycemia and awareness, if you have that, it can reduce um, the time spent in hypoglycemia by using these technologies. So we're going to talk about the self-monitoring blood glucose first. It is also known as SMBG. These are the test strips and meter that we use to check our blood sugars. The benefits is if we check our blood sugar, it helps us stay within blood sugar target range. Recommended timings for checking blood sugar is before meals, two hours after meals, or bedtime and nighttime, which is three or four in the morning if you're on basal insulin. It's not recommended to check eight times a day because that will be impossible due to the pain and the cost associated with uh, glucose monitoring, but it gives you a point in care time, uh, time, sorry, point in care time blood sugar reading. So if you check, let it's individualistic where you check your blood sugar if you are on basal insulin, you check your blood sugar once a day if you're within target A1C of less than 7%. You would check only your fasting blood sugar to make dosing decisions about decisions about your basal insulin. Whereas if you are on basal insulin and you're not within target, you might have to check two times a day in order to uh, make sure that you're on the right dose of insulin. So it could be bedtime and fasting blood sugar that you check. The fasting blood sugar or before meals, the target range for most people with diabetes is between four and seven. And two hours after meal, the blood sugar target is between five to 10 for most people with diabetes. Now, if like Alnur talked about hypoglycemia unawareness, if you have that, then your target might be different. So always talk to your healthcare professionals, your family doctor, your endocrinologist, your diabetes doctor, or your pharmacist in order to find out what your individual target is and based on what you need to check your blood sugar and when you need to do that. So we talked about the limitations that it can be painful to check your blood sugar and poke your finger every time you have to check your blood sugar. But this can be avoided because if you change the needle every time you check your blood sugar on the Lancet device, that can be less painful because the needle becomes less blunt, uh, more blunt with, the, with each of the checking. Um, so you have to change the needle every time. If you check on the sides of the finger rather than the middle of the finger, it's more beneficial because middle of the finger has more nerve endings that make you feel more pain and also alternate different fingers every time you check. But uh, another limitation is to the lack of trends and predictability. As I mentioned, the blood sugar is only in the point in time and doesn't allow any of the blood sugar, what it's going to be in five minutes or an hour later when you eat. So it doesn't provide any predictability or predictability with hypoglycemia. The cost associated with blood sugar is the monitor is free with 100 strips, but each strip costs about a dollar. So that can be expensive for some people, but it is covered under insurance, and it is covered under some government plans. So we will give you a resource at the end of the presentation to download what, what is covered across Canada. So there are different meters with different features, uh, with unique features. So you wanna talk to your pharmacist about which meter is the best for you. 
Um, there are meters for a visually impaired population, which is talking meters such as Oracle. There are glucose readings color coded based on target range. So for example, green could be within range, red could be high, blue could be low. It indicates where you are at the target range, uh, it, whether you are at the target range or not. And there are spill resistance strips swiles. So in AccuCheck guide, you get one strip at a time if, for people who have dexterity issues, so the strips don't fall out if you turn the vial around. Um, light in the background of the screen for precision meal. So for visually impaired, if you're not able to see, sometimes they have bigger numbers and light in the background. Dozing calculator, so freestyle insulin meter has dosing calculator based on carbohydrate counting. So if you're counting your carbs, it tells you how much bolus insulin to take. So these are different meters and many more available in the market. And you should talk to your pharmacist about uh, which one is the best for you. We're going to go on to talk about flash glucose monitoring. So it's a device that is worn at the back of your arm for two weeks, and you put it on with a needle that goes into your skin, and it leaves a monofilament there, but the needle is retracted after uh, it's put on. And that stays on your arm for two weeks. Um, you have to flash the reader or um, the phone to check your blood sugar. Never depend on the blood glucose reading that it gives you because it's not actually a blood glucose reading. It's an interstitial fluid reading. Interstitial fluid is the fluid outside the cells, body cells. So it is lagging behind the capillary blood glucose that we check with the poking of the finger. Uh, capillary blood glucose is more accurate than the interstitial fluid. So when you check, it gives you different um, Aero trends and um, eight hour ago, what your blood sugar was. And you look at the trends rather than just the reading uh, in order to make treatment decisions. It reduces time spent in hypoglycemia because Freestyle Libre 2, which is one of the flash glucose monitor, allows an alarm for low blood sugar. So if you're going or if you're reaching 4.0, it will alarm you that you're going low, or there is an arrow trend that if your air, uh, arrow is pointing down, then you're going into low blood sugar. So at that point in time, you have to monitor with a glucometer to make sure and to confirm a low, because it's not very accurate when your blood sugar is rapidly changing. Um, the limitations for this device is it might have adhesive issues and site irritations. So we're gonna put uh, Dr. Ali Priptani on the spot, one of our panelists, and ask him what he tells his patients about these adhesive issues and site irritation. Welcome, Dr. Ali Praptani. Thanks, uh, Mona. Yeah, so most people, fortunately, don't have any issues with irritation or site issues, but the few who do, we recommend maybe using a different arm or a different part of the arm. That's number one. If that doesn't work, the second thing would be you can go to the pharmacy and ask them for some liquid tape or Benadryl spray, and that can often help and resolve the issue. And lastly, very uncommonly, you might need some kind of uh, cortisone cream, which is probably the uh, last uh, resort. But like I said, most people don't have any issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Ali Priptani. I'll mention this to my patients who have some issues with uh, adhesive uh, and site irritations. Thank you so much. And the cost of it is about $2,000 per year. So you wear a sensor for two weeks, which is 14 days. So one sensor will last you 14 days. So you have two sensors for a month. So you can buy these sensors for $2,000 per year. Uh, but it, it is covered by some insurance companies privately or by the government if you're on insulin, and we will provide you a resource about that based on province to province. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna talk about is continuous glucose monitoring. Um, this one device is uh, specifically is Dexcom G6, but there are other sensors for glucose, continuous glucose monitoring, which we're not talking about today. So the picture you see here, this is the transmitter and the sensor. This is the applicator that you put the sensor on with. This is a phone that you will have, which will show you the blood sugar readings or the reader. 
So in this device, you don't have to flash your phone or reader to check the blood sugar. It will be on the phone by itself. It will transmit the data uh, every five minutes. Um, it also has alarms. So uh, if you're going below four or you're going above 13, it will start to ring. Um, but some people might have a higher target. For example, they are feeling symptoms of low when they are at 3.6 and they might, won't mind if their blood sugar is four. So they don't want to treat it and they don't want an alarm. So always talk to your family doctor or endocrinologist or diabetes educator. Where do you want to set the alarm at? If you have hypoglycemia unawareness, your target might be higher. So if you're if you're keeping your blood sugars at 13 and the alarm tries to ring you and tell you you have high blood sugars and you're comfortable at 13, you don't want the alarm to ring at 13. You want the alarm to be at 15 so it will alert you about the high blood sugar. Um, but if you're checking your blood sugars over time, it will give you a better blood sugar control and help you with fewer complications of diabetes. Uh, this device uh, or this sensor and transmitter can go on the body at the back, on the abdomen, or on the arms, um, and it uh, stays on for 10 days. So this is different than the 14 days that the flash glucose monitor stays on. And also, I forgot to mention something about the glucometer. So the glucometer loses its accuracy after a year. So if you want uh, to change the meter after every year, that's a good thing to do because the meter is free. The strips are what costs um, money. And if you buy 100 strips, the meter is for free. If you want to check the accuracy of your meter, you can take your meter when you go for your blood work. And when they check your blood sugar on the blood work, when they take the blood from your veins, you check your blood sugar at that time, you poke your finger and you compare the results. If it's within 10% difference, that your, your meter is accurate. But if it's more than 10%, then you need a new meter. Uh, cost of the Dexcom G6 is actually $6,000 uh, per year, three to $6,000 per year. So it is more expensive than flash glucose monitor, but again, some insurance companies and some government plans cover it. So we'll give you a resource based on that. And we have a Jamaati member uh, named Zahoor, who has just recently started on Dexcom G6, who's gonna talk further about uh, his lived experience with this device. So we have a resource available in the um, resource list for this webinar about coverage of intermittent and continuous glucose monitoring devices across Canada. Partial or full coverage and criteria vary from province to province. Coverage may also be obtainable through certain private insurers. So speak to your family health team or healthcare professional team which device is good for you. And please see the resource section to download the document. It's the document from Diabetes Canada. Thanks, Mona, for the very informative talk on the various technologies available to measure our blood sugar levels and to help us better manage our diabetes. I would like to now introduce Zahur Mawani, who will share his experience with managing his diabetes. Hello, Zahur. Welcome to the webinar today. and. Uh, to, uh, to ex share your experience with uh, your managing your diabetes. The first question I have for you today is how long have you had diabetes? I've had diabetes approximately over 18 years. 18 years and type one or type two? Type two diabetes. Two diabetes. Um, up to now, what have you been using to measure your blood sugar levels? I've been using the prick yourself meters and the testing strips, uh, the AccuCheck and the Contour Next and uh, where uh, you have to prick yourself and then it gives you a reading on the meter, which is quite cumbersome. And uh, after a while, you just slack off doing it. Like That's I right. did and many of my other di fellow diabetics that I speak to, they slack off too. So, so how often, when you say slack off, how often would you test? 
I started regularly with about four or five times a day as instructed by my EP and my diabetes specialist. And then after a while, when my fasting sugars were getting to be similar and two hours after meals, before a meal, all that was becoming too tedious because sometimes you're not in at home all the time or it's convenient to test it because you're outside or you're away or whatever, right? So then uh, lifestyle didn't permit regular testing. So, so if that was the case, then what would you say about, um, were you able to manage your blood sugar levels with meters adequately? Not as adequately as I'm doing it now with the new glu continuous glucose monitoring systems that are out there. Particularly, I'm using the Dexcom G6 and I've been doing it for the past month and a half, and I find it it's very, very helpful, and it's awesome. Great. So when you were using the meters, would you say you were experiencing higher blood sugar levels, and how often would you be experiencing these events? Oh, every couple of days or sometimes even twice a day, I would suddenly doze off or slack off, and uh, if my sugars went high, I would just have a nap or something, you know, and... Uh, without realizing that it's my sugar or sometimes just, I thought I'm tired from just being outside or doing any activity. But now I realize it that after this continuous monitoring system, I'm taking more medications in time and to prevent a highs from coming onto and the lows from coming onto because this continuous indicators and alerts that tell you where your sugars are heading. Right. So you tell. Uh, so um, you've talked about it a bit already. But so you recently changed to like a Dexcom G6, and tell me about your experience with it so far in the month and a half that you've used it. Every day, continuous. Every five minutes, it gives you a reading. Every time you eat, just before you mm -hmm. eat, you know what you're eating, you know your sugar trend is going to go up. So then it'll tell you how much insulin you need to take to regulate it. And that's why, you know, uh, so far, so good. Excellent. No Excellent. So you're, would you say it's better, it's helping you better manage your diabetes? Yes, much, much better. So, and, and so you, you get the alerts, so you're able to respond to them in a much quicker fashion, right? Most definitely. And also it uh, indicates to you when you're going low, so then you know what to eat or drink to counter it and get your sugars in check and in target range. Yes, it's very important, as we said earlier, to prevent hypoglycemia. Um, right. Excellent. And so one final question, what would you say is the most useful feature of the Dexcom D6? The alerts and the continuous readings it gives you without pricking yourself. You don't need to prick yourself every time to get a reading. Yes, that, that's you very valuable. You the sensor and you change it every 10 days or so. <laughs> It gives you continuous reading for 10 days. Yes, yes, excellent. Well, we, um, we're we uh, trying to, thank you for sharing your time with us today. We're trying to highlight some of the welcome. new technologies that are available. Um, it's worked really well for you and that's amazing. We um, also would tell people that this is something that if they're interested in, they can talk to their healthcare professionals if, they, if this would work for them as well. So thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your story with us and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Yali Madad. Malani Madad. Now, I would like to introduce our next panelist, Dr. Ali Praptani. Dr. Praptani is the first Ismaili endocrinologist in Canada and is a full professor of medicine at McMaster University. He is also deputy of Global Health Partnerships, Aga Khan Health Services. Dr. Praptani is currently on the clinical Guidelines Task Force for Diabetes Canada and Hypertension Canada. He is also a consultant for the South Asian Diabetes Chapter for Diabetes Canada. He has received several awards from the university and professional associations regionally, nationally, and globally. Dr. Pribhtani will give us some information on flash intermittent glucose monitoring and the detailed information they can provide. Over to you, Dr. Pribhtani. Thank you so much, Onuram. I'm going to be speaking to you today about uh, flash glucose monitoring in terms of its interpretation. Amona already did a very nice job of reviewing 
what it is. And Alnur did a fantastic job about hypoglycemia. And this is a great uh, segue uh, to the next part. So today we'll hopefully share some information on how to interpret glucose reports from this glucose monitoring system, how to share the data with your healthcare provider and with other uh, family members, if that's the need, and what are the actual benefits, which have already been covered, but I'll reiterate some of those. So you've already seen this. We have two uh, uh, flash glucose monitoring systems available in Canada right now. There's the Libre, which is the original, and there's the Libre 2. The Libre 2 is supposed to be a little bit more accurate. It has alarms and uh, more accurate at uh, low blood sugars. And basically, this is making it very convenient for pa uh, patients to monitor glucose levels, unlike uh, the, the glucose pricks that have been traditionally being done in the, in the past. And before I move on further, I just wanted to comment, let me go on to the actual interpretation for the Dexcom or the continuous glucose monitoring. The reports are very similar, but I just wanted to make sure that I mentioned that because the principles are very, very similar. But I'm going to focus on flash glucose monitoring interpretation. So there's two ways you can, actually three ways you can look at the data when you use this uh, system. One way is you can get a reader with the actual uh, sensors when you, when you purchase this or through a prescription, and that's provided by the, the prescription. The second way is you can download the app on your phone where you get a lot more information. And the third way, which you get the most information is you actually sign up on the online account and you get lots more information uh, through uh, libreview.com. Very, very easy. You just got to go on to the online site and it'll guide you how to uh, access these reports and actually how to uh, register and, and sign in going forward and sharing it with your other healthcare providers and family members if need be so. So this is what you see actually on the phone app and there's seven very, very important screens which I share the same principles with the online uh, viewing. The most important thing is the first on the right. I'm gonna go from right to left, sort of like Arabic. So the most important thing is that the more you test, the more accurate the, the data becomes. So this is the sensor usage. The second from the right is the estimated hemoglobin A1C, which you're often your healthcare provider will do on a blood test. And here it's known as the glucose management indicator. This gives you a rough idea of what your overall blood sugars are over three months time. Number three, the, th the third last slide is something called the daily patterns. This gives you an overall average profile of how your sugars are doing over the last two weeks, the last month, or the last three months. Next to that, to the left of it is the average glucose. This gives you sort of a day-to-day -day pattern of what are your average glucose levels, for example, on a Monday or a Tuesday or on a Wednesday. And can, this can be done over a two-week period, like I said, a seven-day period, or up to 90 days. The next one after that, which is a very important one, is when are you going low and how often are you going low? This gives you the low glucose events or the hypoglycemia. And I really want to make it uh, stress that before doing anything for diabetes, especially on medication, is you want to get rid of low blood glucose levels and you want to find out what they're happening so you can minimize these. Then you can become more aggressive in terms of tightening up your control. To the left of that is something called time and target. This is a new concept. This, this tells you where you should be in most of the time. And most people should be within four to 10 based on the International Diabetes Federation in the green, which is between four, which is between four and 10. And it should be more than 70% of the time. The last one, which is the first one on the far left is something called the daily graph. This gives you sort of an overall profile in terms of the day uh, on that day. What are your sugars doing that for, for that particular day? So this is the, this is what the app will show you on your phone, whether it's an Android or an iPhone or, or otherwise. So what about the online report? Again, it gives you very similar uh, information, but it gives you more of a bigger sort of picture. And this one page captures everything that I talked about on those previous seven slides. So this is a bird's eye view of the entire picture. It's like the forest rather than the multiple trees, which I showed you on the previous slide. So the first thing you wanna know is <clears throat> you wanna make sure you're monitoring enough. Then you're gonna look at something called the time and target, which I mentioned. Then you're gonna look at the, 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 the low blood sugars and the very high blood sugars. Then below that, you're gonna look at something called the ambulatory glucose profile. And I will go into more detail. The ambulatory glucose profile gives you lots more information, which we'll discuss briefly. And I know it sounds like a lot right now, but the more you practice this, the easier it becomes. I'm just giving you sort of a one-shot view, but you gotta go home if you have this device and practice it on a regular basis. And when you share it with your healthcare provider, it'll become even easier. And it can really help us and you to improve your glucose control and empower you. So again, like I mentioned, the first most important thing is you wanna capture as much data as possible. You wanna be sensing more than 70% of the time. And the more you do it, the more accurate the data becomes. All the data becomes more accurate. And if you can see, that's indicated right on the top where it says percent time sensor active. This person was active for more than 99%, which is very active. He or she must be monitoring maybe even a lot more than maybe they should be. 
So that's that. <clears throat> Next, as I mentioned, you want, you want to look at the A1C, the hemoglobin A1C, which is the three month average. Here it's known as the glucose management indicator. And for most people, you want that number less than 7%. And in some people, less than 6.5%, especially if you're quite active and the risk of low blood sugars or hypoglycemia is quite low. The next thing we look at is something called the glucose variability. This tells us how variable your sugars are throughout the day or throughout that three months or throughout that month. And generally speaking, we want it not that variable because there is data to show the more variability there is, you might have more complications. And the definition of low variability is usually less than 36%. So this person was at 49.5%, which is a little bit more variable than we would have liked. So the other thing you can get also here is the average glucose. And this for, for this person, over 14 days, as you can see on the top right, is around 9.6. And most people's average sugar, we want to keep it, you know, probably a little bit lower than that. So this is the time and range, which is a different graph, but still shown on that one page on the online view, but on a different screen on your app or the reader. So for most people, you want it between four and 10 and more than 70% of the time. Low blood sugar is less than 4% of the time, very high, less than 20% of the time, and, ve and, 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 and very, very high, less than probably 5% of the time. So this is what the International Diabetes Federation says. So if you look at the, on the left, that's for very active, highly functional uh, members. You want it even tighter. But on the right, that's for more frail, older people who you want to loosen up because the reason you want to loosen up is you want to avoid the risk of hypoglycemia. So here we want the range to be more than 50%, lows less than 1%, and highs we are, we're allowing up to 60% because your targets are very different as, as, as you get older and more frail because the benefit is not that high at that stage when you're quite frail. This is the ambulatory glucose profile that I was mentioning. And now this gives you a lot of information. And there's four approaches how to interpret this. First thing is, what, where are the low blood sugars occurring and how are they occurring? And the low blood sugars here are set at four. So as you can see in this, or 3.9, sorry. So as you can see in this person, if this patient is not going low very often. So that's a very reassuring thing. If <clears throat> the graph, if the bars, or especially the blue line was mainly below 3.9, that would be very concerning. The other thing that tells you is below there's the time on the x-axis, it'll tell you where the problem is occurring. And a lot of people have low blood sugars in the middle of the night, which we call nocturnal hypoglycemia, because either they've taken too much insulin at bedtime, their dietary pattern has not been very good around supper time or even late lunch, and you can make some modifications, or they might have exercised a lot at nighttime without checking their blood sugars. The second thing we look at is the median line, which is the dark blue line. This gives you what's happening 50% of the time. Okay, so you want to really look at this line. It shows you what your sort of your profile throughout the day uh, in the median curve. It gives you sort of a rough idea of your overall control. And as long as it's between the 3.9 to 10, it tells you it's actually quite good as it is for this patient. The next thing you look at is the steep rises and the drops. And this will sort of indirectly also tell you about uh, a variability. As you can see <coughs> here, you're not seeing a lot of steep rises and drops. And that'll tell you a little bit about the variation not being too bad. Although if you look at, I'm gonna show you the next step, which is the fourth step, which is the shaded curves. Is it wide or narrow? And the wider that it is, the more variability is. If you see the light gray, it's quite wide. So there is a quite a bit of variability despite the median curve being in, 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 in target. So what's the goal here? You want something called FINER. You want a flat, narrow, in range glucose profile. As you can see here, it's pretty flat, but it's quite wide telling you it's not that variable, but it's in range. So how is this patient doing? Reasonably well, but there is still room for improvement, especially with the variability and the coefficient of variation. Now, if you wanna re go really, really deep, you can, get, you can look at something called the day-to-day -day patterns in terms of where is the problem in terms of a day-to-day -day basis. And, you, and in North America, most of the problem usually is around nighttime or bedtime and on the weekends. And you can see it here, right? Look at the Fridays and Saturdays. In fact, this person even starts on Thursdays having uh, issues with highs, which is the sort of the yellow highlight. So this gives you a little bit more very fine detail of where the problems may be on a day-to-day -day basis. And that can affect in terms of changing your diet, your exercise pattern, and even your medications, in particular insulin, or, if, or even if you're sick, it can help you make some modifications. So, I've sort of gone through the approach to interpreting a flash glucose monitoring. And the bottom line is we're so used to only looking at the A1C or capillary blood sugars, but that has limitations. The time and range which we can get from the glucose monitoring with this device can give you better insights into your control and make changes with your diet 
and gives you feedback, instant feedback or where you can make changes. The glucose profile does the same thing. And most importantly, it detects where the problems with hypoglycemia and how we can make those changes, gives you patterns, trends, and targets, and where is the variability and how to deal with that. You can share this with your healthcare provider or even with your family. And hopefully by doing all this, you can win and reduce your A1C, minimize hypoglycemia, and hopefully have more convenience and improve compl and decrease complications and increase the time in target. And when I talk about complications, we're aiming for the heart, kidney, and the brain. But the data just shows that for this monitoring system, there is data that there is some reduction in eye, foot, and kidney disease complications. Overall, it's going to help you make changes with your diet, or your lifestyle, and your exercise to overall improve your control. And the most important thing is to empower yourself. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Pratani, for the excellent information you presented on how we can use the reports from the new devices to help manage our diabetes. Now, I would like to call on Mona again to talk about the meaningful movement pillar of Five to Thrive and set, setting some SMART goals. Thank you, Alnoor. Um, so we are going to talk about Five to Thrive uh, initiative now. This Five to Thrive initiative is by Health Board Canada. Um, and Alphan Health Board Canada, and it talks about five ways to live a healthier life. So when we talk, the first pillar was um, about healthy eating and what you can do to prevent chronic diseases as well as to thrive with these chronic diseases. Chronic diseases are something like diabetes, heart disease, dementia, cancers, arthritis, and you want to make sure that you can prevent these diseases by a having a healthy lifestyle. So today's topic is uh, meaningful movement. This is the second pillar of Five to Thrive initiative. We wanna do something that is enjoyable uh, from our side so that we can continue doing that in our daily lives. And these principles, five ways to move better, help you build on your physical activity as you go on. So if you're not doing anything currently, if you're not walking, you're not exercising, you want to build activity into your daily routine. So you can take the stairs instead of the elevator, park your car farther away and walk to the grocery store. Or if you're working and you have, you're in a building, you can walk to another floor to use the bathroom. There are many ways to stay active and every step counts. If you're already moving uh, throughout your day, then you can try to move every 30 to 60 minutes. Get up and move because it helps increase the circulation in your brain, heart, and muscles. So you might think that you're wasting time by getting up every 30 to 60 minutes to walk for 10 minutes, right? But it's really important because it helps you become more efficient because it increases the circulation. If you're already moving up and doing yoga every 30 to 60 minutes or just um, wiggling your toes at your desk or go going for water breaks uh, and walking to the water fountain, um, you can try to take a brisk walk for at least 30 minutes every day. This is actually coming from Canadian uh, uh, physical activity guidelines for people with diabetes. And it translates into 150 minutes per week minimum of physical activity, aerobic physical activity, which is 30 minutes, five days a week of walking. If you don't have 30 minutes, you can walk for 10 minutes at a time. And it's actually shown improved blood sugar readings for about 10 minutes of walking. If you want to experiment, you can check your blood sugar before you go for a walk and then walk for 10 minutes and then check your blood sugar right after coming back from a walk of 10 minutes, and you'll see the difference. And it will actually motivate, it has motivated some of my clients to go for a walk every day. If you're already walking 30 minutes, five days a week, and you're already getting minimum of 150 minutes exercise daily, uh, every week, then you can try a weekly group exercise class, such as Zumba, yoga, Tai Chi, dance, cycling, chair exercises, and more. Classes are a great way to stay accountable. If you have already joined two or three classes a week, then you can add movement into your social time with friends and family. I actually know uh, people who are doing walk meetings instead of lunch meetings at work. So it actually helps them be more active and helps take a step towards healthy lifestyle. 
Um, if you go onto the IA Canada website or the website resource is going to be provided with our uh, webinar today, you can actually download this uh, infographic and you can put it on your fridge that will remind you to be active every day. This, uh, there are also on the IA Canada website, a uh, physical activity bingo. There's an activity tracker. There is um, uh, some uh, videos, exercises uh, for physical activity. So make sure to check that out. And this resource will be available in the link. Um, and I'm gonna talk about how we can take all this and have a smart goal. So let's go onto that slide. Okay, so based on um, what we talked about today, we wanna take some actionable goals. And to make a goal, we want to make a SMART goal. So SMART goal stands for being specific. So what is your goal? Being measurable. How will you keep track of the progress that you make? Attainable. How will you achieve your goal? You will make a plan. It has to be relevant. So how will this goal help you? And timely. When will you achieve this goal? So let's make a goal. You can make any goal that you want, but let's go through an example. So my goal is to achieve a minimum of 150 minutes per week of meaningful movement, example walking, without experiencing hypoglycemia. I'll track my progress by monitoring my and recording my blood sugar before and after the activities and monitoring my walks every day on the calendar. I'll achieve this goal by doing the following. I'll walk 30 minutes after lunch or dinner, Monday to Friday, and give myself a break on the weekends. The goal will help me because it will help motivate me to do regular blood sugar checks and live healthy with diabetes. And it will help me motivate, understand the uh, uh, physical activity, how it affects my blood sugars. I'll complete this goal by... Uh, you have to put a date on there, but I'll achieve this goal in a month, review, and gradually increase my activity to reach 150 minutes of exercise a week. So if I'm not doing 30 minutes every day, let's say I, my goal was to do 10 minutes a day, five days a week, then I'll increase every week or every month to make sure that I achieve the 150 minutes per week minimum. This smart goal web, uh, web uh, sorry, this smart goal uh, will be available for downloading and you can write down your own goals uh, with the webinar. And if you have put your email addresses uh, for the Al Khan Health Board to contact you, then they will contact you with how you're doing and progressing with uh, these SMART goals and what you have learned throughout the uh, five to thrive pillars. And stay tuned for rest of the pillars to be published. Thank you. Thanks, Mona, for the fantastic information on how we can stay active and how to use the SMART goals to keep keep on track and to keep our um, uh, goals online. Um, now, this brings us to the end of our webinar today. Before we end, I would like to ask Mona and Dr. Ali Pratani for one final, one final takeaway point. What would you say, Mona? Thank you, Alnoor. So I would say that when you're checking your blood sugars, it's really important to know what your reading is, but it's more important to what your response to your reading is. So for example, if you get an eight in the morning and the target range is between four and seven, if you get stressed about it, it's going to increase your blood sugar even more. But if you go for a exercise or if you eat healthier, and that's your response, then that's going to help you control your blood sugar. So I think what your response is to the blood sugar reading is really important. Excellent. Thank you. And how about you, Dr. Prapani? Thanks, Elner. I'm going to leave with a very positive note today that in 2022 and going forward, there's a lot of good news with diabetes. You can do a lot to prevent complications, to empower yourself, and to live a pretty good life, very similar to someone without diabetes in this day and age compared to the past. With all the technologies we have and the simple lifestyle measures that can be easily adopt adoptable, not only to help with your diabetes, but to help with a lot of other chronic conditions. So it's all good news, everyone. All the best. That's, that's fantastic advice. Thank you so much. I would like to thank Monica Bani and Dr. Preptani for the excellent information provided to us today and to Zahur Mawani for sharing his experience with us. 
Thank you for joining us today. And we ask that you fill out an evaluation, which will arrive in the next 24 hours or so. The feedback we receive allows us to determine whether these webinars are helpful and if we should continue doing them. We will also contact you if you consent in the next month for final feedback or actions you may have completed, you may have implemented as a result of the webinar today. Finally, I would like to invite everyone to join us for our next session, the third in our series of Your Health is Your Wealth webinars on April 26th on the topic of cancer screening. Thank you everyone and have a good day.